just trying to understand it, I guess. Yes. I'm wondering if there's anything I can do to get a glimpse of you. Well, that's... There are many things that you can do to get glimpses. What you are getting a glimpse of is not my experience. My experience is uh, literally non-dual. So all experience is in fact dualistic. And I mean, there are, they are expansive, profound, uh, enlightening, opening, awakening kind of experiences that will have profound impacts on you and your life potentially that can occur. There are numerous uh, methodologies uh, that are proposed to bring that about. The satsang is one of them. Uh, there are various meditations. There's some very good drugs that you can take that are almost guaranteed to give you a very expanded kind of uh, experience. So there are many things that you can do. The pointer of this, the pointers of this particular teaching are always pointing beyond the experiential. That essence, which you are, the context in which all of the experiences and the experience, including the experience of you happen. Well, actually the truth be told, it's the glimpses that are the juice in all of this. Uh, because beyond that, there is literally nothing, no thingness. Now it is not avoid this no thingness. It is infinite potential, it is, but the experience and the, the wonderful unitive experience is only available in duality. So what should I do right now? <laughs> well, I have a suggestion. Okay. Okay. And that is, do not, under any circumstances, forget to breathe. Because if you continue to breathe, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. I mean, there, there could be an embolism rushing to your brain as, as we speak, and that the you you will find yourself unable to follow this very sage advice but in the event that you are so empowered then by all means continue to breathe and i promise you that if you do that things will happen <laughs> And what do you do when you're not uh, watching spiritual videos and attending Zen Sangha? We develop antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Right. So my, within the language of this teaching, this living teaching of Advaita, the, such drugs eliminate the emotional and psychological pain associated with various conditions. And so as a result, they, I mean, they can be quite beneficial potentially for, for people. The root of the suffering that we talk about is uh, far deeper and more insidious in a way, because it is a claim that you are an independent entity. There's a sense that you're disconnected from 
everything else. That you are in fact independent. And this is the root from which all suffering arises, this particular characteristic or quality, if you will, that arises in virtually every human being at around the age of two years old. Why I, I couldn't begin to tell you, but it does, and observably so. So in a few people, uh, they're drawn to question this uh, assumption that really has been part of your being for since you were two, that you're independent, that somehow that doesn't sit right, that you may have had some kind of insight, that there's some recognition that the way the people and the society and everything is orienting stuff just is not quite on target. That there's something not right there. That's the point at which you become a spiritual seeker and end up, you know, on the internet looking at spiritual videos and going to Zen sanghas and things. That because there is a itch that develops. It's not right. Something's got to, there, there's got to be some other way of orienting and being than simply this. And there is. And you've already sniffed the perfume of that. So that's, there's no going back once that happens. You're, as Ramana Maharshi said, uh, your head is in the tiger's mouth, the jaws have closed, and there is no escape. Now, as to what happens once your head goes in the tiger's mouth, that's completely variable. Orient myself toward. And, well, that's just another or subtle form of the doing that the teaching says you can't do. <laughs> so, you know, okay. <laughs> and it gets even subtler than that. It's you don't surrender, you allow. Mm -hmm. So you, in fact, don't even like do anything. You mm -hmm. simply allow to be what is, is another notion. But it's still a, just a more subtle form of that kind of, doing. Now the doing, and this is a, a level of subtlety that we have here in this teaching that you may not encounter, have encountered so far. The doing is not the culprit <laughs> in this teaching. The, I mean, there's much to do. As long as you're breathing, you will do. You will think, you will feel, you'll go to the bathroom, you'll get up in the morning, you'll have thoughts and desires and impulses and actions of all kinds. You are a doing machine. Yeah. You're going to do stuff. And so we're not, and if you stop doing stuff, they're going to come and they're going to burn you or bury you because if, when you stop doing stuff, that is indication that you are dead. And they have to dispose of you before you start to smell in some way. So the doing is intrinsic. So when we say there is nothing you can do, it's the more subtle understanding is there is nothing you can author. There is no doing that you can author as the source of the doing. That's the pointer of the teaching. It's not a truth. And it's, it's presented to you here as something to possibly look at that is of any interest. That you are not the author, but rather the instrument through which life is happening. Your life is happening. 
if you tell me your name one more time, it may stick. Adrian. Adrian. Try and get rid of it. It's a, well, people will call you something, <laughs> whether it's hey you or uh. <clears throat> uh so Adrian's kind of a useful word. And even those people who are reputed to have lost their self, such as Ramana Maharshi. Have you run across that name? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Ah, okay. So yeah, Ramana is probably the least controversial of the, uh, the you know, he's comfortably dead. He's Indian and he's, you know, historically removed far enough to be non-controversial. And the, but, and widely accepted as being, you know, a, a realized master. So, but he, when Rob, when somebody called Ramana, he turned around, even though there was quote no self there. So there is still ident identity. We can even say there is identification. But what is absent is identification as an independent author. And so we have to keep getting to my mind in order to really understand what all of these sages and, and teachers have been pointing at. You have to get much more subtle and get to that real fine distinction between the doing and the authoring, between the sense of being someone and being an independent someone. Because that fine distinction is where the suffering really emerges from. And that's all this teaching is concerned with is the reduction in suffering. Enlightenment is not really basically discussed here. It's not a, a goal or an aspiration or you know, an attainment. It is the reduction of suffering that we're really concerned with. You know? Enlightenment itself is the end of suffering, and that happens as all kinds of things happen. But the teaching itself is concerned with the reduction of suffering. You're very welcome. We've dumped a whole ton of stuff on top of you, and we'll see what well, what sticks. It's sort of like throwing. Uh, spaghetti at the refrigerator see whether it's done or not and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't so if any question percolates please feel free to ask it but none are required adrian the main reason i think i'm separate sure because it just seems very separate. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's where I just right. don't know what you mean by not separate. Okay. And so let's choose, let's use another word. Rather than separate, let's use the word independent. So because, and the, the, image that is often used in this teaching, which I find useful in addressing this, is of the ocean and the wave. So if all there is is ocean, everything is ocean, each object can be thought of as a wave, a movement of the ocean. And since there are in this dualistic universe, many waves, each wave can be said to be separate from the other in as much as it can observe another and can interact with another, which requires separation. If they're not separate, they can't 
have relationship. And so we have relationship between separate ways where the whole metaphor starts to become the insanity of the human experience, if you will, that is in the arising of this sense that within the wave, I am not a wave. I am a droplet. And all of these other waves are droplets also. So it is a denial of what is. It is a restructuring and a, we, a re orienting, if you will, by the wave, within the context of the wave, because there isn't anything outside of the ocean. The ocean is all there is. That's the, the, the metaphor that we use. To, and that accounts for your experience of being separate from me or separate from Nagora. And thus capable of having a relationship. One more question. You can ask as many questions as you like. So then instrument of. And the ocean is not an object. You see, the ocean is literally all without another, without a context. The ocean does not exist within a bigger framework as something. So when we ask this question of what is the ocean, the only way that we can do that is to objectify the ocean, to make it an object. And it is not, it is everything, the context, that which we are and everything is. You're very welcome.